welcome all those who are watching by internet right now. And the regular speaker for tonight, Sister Jackson, she's going to be here next, next Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. She had to go out of town because of an emergency. So, Lord, just help her and her family, whatever they're going through, in Jesus' name. But, you know, I want to walk into the fullness of God's will for my life. And, Michael, could you start that countdown clock? Otherwise, I'll get long-winded. But I want to I wanna, I wanna walk into the fullness of I want to know the perfect will of the Father. And actually, this is what I tell people. I ask people wherever I go, and don't lift your hands. I said, how many of you have ever heard the audible voice of God? And many times when I go out ministering, very few hands get lifted. But what they don't understand, that really they have heard the audible voice of God. Because this is God's audible voice. Every time you pick up your Bible, every time you read it out loud, that is the voice of God talking to you. I know that God created me and formed me and fashioned me and you to be just like him because he said, let us make man in our likeness and our image. And God created you for relationship. God created you for intimacy. God created you for oneness. And that's what we discovered in the Gospel of John chapter 17, verse 21 to verse 23, when the very last thing that Jesus prayed to the Heavenly Father, he said, Father, that they may be one with us, even as we are one. Wow, that's a mouthful. You know, in order for that to happen, it cannot just be the natural workings of the human mind. Because there's something within us that's always wanting to divide and split and run away from each other. It's amazing. You think about this. How many American men, when they get into their upper years, they talk about just finding a cabin out into the woods and getting away from everybody? My natural father did that. He did. He got a cabin, and he went to start a fire one night, not realizing birds had built a nest into the chimney, and he, he, he died from carbon monoxide poisoning. Because he had to get away. I had that within me. I had to get away. I had to get away. I just had to be alone. I just had to be by myself. You know, I don't know why people sometimes when they go through hardships in their marriage, they say, well, we just need to separate from one another for a little bit. No, I think you just need to get together more. I just think you need to just hang around a little bit more. I think you just need to talk a little bit more and not talk at each other, but talk to one another. How's that? I think you just need to have a little bit more of a romantic atmosphere created around you, amen? I'm telling you what, I am, I, I am closer to my wife now than I have ever been after 34 years of marriage. And it's Jesus Christ that makes me one with my wife. See, Christ wants to make us one. The devil comes to divide. He comes to conquer. But Christ comes to unify. Christ wants us to be one body. One Lord, one faith, one family, one big happy family. Say happy family. <laughs> See, God wants to fill you with joy because the joy of the Lord is your strength. He said, Father, that they may be one with us even as we are one. Why? That the world may believe, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and that thou hast loved them as thou hast lived, loved me. He said, Lord, Father, the glory you have given to me, I have given to them. The glory, his manifested presence. How do I know what the will of the Father is? I know what the perfect will of the Father is by looking at Jesus Christ. As I look at Jesus Christ and I begin to become obsessed with Jesus Christ. See, because you need to understand that you are a vessel. Say a vessel. You are a container. And you are going to be filled and you are going to be full of something. He's preaching. Go ahead, preach with me, son. He is. He's preaching with me. I know what he's doing. You're going to be full of something. Tell somebody you're full of something. You will, you are, you're going to be full of something. Either you're going to be full of the world, full of cares, full of the deceitfulness of riches, full of fear, full of anxiety, full of lust. You are a vessel. You can't help but be filled. So you can't help the fact that you're a vessel. As a matter of fact, God created us to be a vessel. Listen, the Bible says even the very heavens cannot contain God, but yet we were created to contain God. Isn't that amazing? He said, I will live in them, and I will walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
Christ in us, the hope of glory. How can that be? How can Christ come? See, there's something mystical about man. We've been made in the likeness and the image of God. We were created for relationship with God. We were created to be one with God. We'll never be omnipresent, all-knowing, all-powerful. But we are made to be one with God in his character, in his nature, in his attitude, in, his, in, 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 in how he operates and functions. And, and, and when you see me, what God's is that you are seeing Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, Paul said to the Thessalonians, he said, when I came unto you, you received me not as a man, but as Christ Jesus himself. That is amazing that we can get to the place to where we're so full of Jesus that he literally permeates out of our very pores. He flows out of our mouth. He beams out of our eyes and he reaches out of our hands. No, isn't that exciting? You can be so one with Jesus. You can be so one with God to where people literally will call you a Christian. See, the church never called it a Christian, itself a Christian. They said, you're one of them Christians, I can tell. How? Because of the love they had for one another. Because of the power. Because of the victory. Because of the authority. Because of the virtue. Because of the nature. Because of the character. Because of the life of God that was in them. See, Jesus said, I am come that you might have life. Point at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you. He said, I am come that you might have life. Now, we're not talking about a natural life. We're talking about a supernatural life. We're talking about the quickening of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about Zoe life. We're talking about the life that God has. How many know that God never has a bad hair day? God never has a blue Monday. How do you know that God, God, God doesn't just so despair for life, he wants to die? Aren't you glad? You know, the Bible says, and, 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 and today my son Michael and I were talking about the kingdom of God has come among you. Well, the kingdom is there where the king is. And we got the king here with us tonight. And he is the king of kings and lord of lords. And that king lives inside of us. And he has overcame principalities and powers. And he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. See, the devil's already defeated. We just got to get that revelation. You know, one day Jesus was talking to his disciples, whom do men say I am? And they were telling him. And then he said, but this is the big question. Who do you say I am? And they all stood there. And I'm sure for a while it was quiet. But... Peter finally just, you know, you know, Peter was the kind of guy who would just blurt out whatever was in his mind. And he blurted out, he said, you are the Christ. You are the anointed. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And when he said that, Jesus, I believe he backed up. And I, I think he just, he smiled the biggest smile he had ever smiled. And he said, blessed are thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And then he made an amazing statement. He said, I'm going to build my church upon this rock, this foundation of my Father showing you who I am. Did you know that's what Jesus said in John 15, 16, and 17? He said, the only way you can know who I am is if the Father reveals me to you. You know, you ought to be so happy. Because if you've accepted Jesus Christ, that means the Heavenly Father has revealed His Son to you. Now, a lot of times, revelation is progressive. You know what I mean by that? For in words, we don't get the whole revelation and one big old, you know, one, one big old outpouring of God upon us. He gives us progressive revelation. He begins, because we couldn't handle it all at one time. Ha have you ever had such a touch of God? You said, oh God, if you bless me anymore, I'm going to die. Have you ever been so blessed that God, you said, you thought you died and went to heaven, and yet he just gave you a little dab. He just gave you a little, he just gave you a little drop because he couldn't pour it all out on you. Matter of fact, the Bible says no man can look upon God and live. But he said, my father has revealed this to you. But you know what? We need to ask God to give us a deeper revelation of who Jesus is. 
The more I know Jesus, the more I will be like Jesus. You are a vessel. You're going to be filled with something. I was made to be filled with Jesus Christ. I was made to be filled with the Father. I was made to be filled with the Holy Ghost. As a matter of fact, the Bible commands us. He's told his disciples, I don't want you guys to leave Jerusalem until you be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire and power. Amen? See, God wants us to be full of of the Holy Ghost. He doesn't want us to be full of worry and fear and anxiety and, 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 and you know, a, a big head, pride and all of this other stuff. He wants us to be full of him. Well, your eye gate is so important because literally whatever comes into your eye gate will possess your soul. That's why the Bible says don't put nothing wicked before your eyes. You cannot help it. See, the Bible says God is a consuming fire. You may not know it, but you are a fire. I mean, I'm, people have seen you get hot at times. There's a fire burning in all of us. See, and that literally that's why we're not cold-blooded animals. We're warm-blooded. We're not animals, thank God. We're the children of God. But the truth of the matter is we got a temperature that must be maintained. We, we are like an oven inside, and you have an oven. And when you cook a turkey in an oven and you begin to cook it real slow at night, in the morning when you wake up, you smell that aroma of that turkey cooking. I like it when my wife puts a roast into the slow cooker and I wake up early in the morning to pray and the first thing I do is I smell the aroma of the roast saying, come and eat me, come and eat me, come and eat me. <laughs> so I'll go down there sometimes and I'll take the lid off and I'll cut very carefully and I'll take a slice of it and cover it up with the onions on top so I can get away with it. But that roast calls me. But you know what? That roast, I mean that, that slow cooker or that oven doesn't care what you put in it. You, you could put a dead polecat. How many know what a polecat is? You could put a dead skunk in that oven and it would cook it just as good as it would a turkey or a ham or a roast. It don't care. Listen, your mind is an incubator. And whatever you plant in your mind will cook. And it will hatch. And you will give birth. Listen, we hear about these terrible atrocities that people are doing today. Let me tell you something. They just didn't wake up one day being a murderer, being a rapist, being a killer, being a robber. No, it's seed that got planted into the soul of their soul. See, because you're made from dirt. From dirt your flesh came to dirt, it will return. And whatever seed you plant in your dirt will grow. Now, here's the problem. If anybody's ever been a gardener or if you've ever been on a farm, you know the farmer does everything he can to plant the right seed, to plant the right crop, and to get rid of the weeds because he knows the weeds will choke out the life of the good product or the good plant. And if he lets the, seed, the weed grow next to the good product or the good, the good, the good plant, then it will bring forth no fruit. Well, see, that's why it's so important. That as a man thinketh, so is he. My mind, my heart, must, my life must be filled and flooded with the reality of Jesus Christ. See, I, I realize that. I don't know how I did it, but when I first got born again, I was manic depressant. I, my mind was, I was schizophrenic. I, my mind was everywhere. I mean, I was just, I was, you know, I'm just going to be a real quick illustration of what I was like. Because when I was born, I had a speech impediment. I had a hearing problem. I had lung problems. I had psychological problems. When I used to talk to how I talked, I was tongue-tied until I got filled with the Holy Ghost. And God loosed my tongue, and I've never shut up. You know that. But listen, before I got born again... I used to smoke dope, pop pills, drink wine every day. I smoked three packs of cigarettes, not including the Swiss or sweets and the cigars. I chewed chewing tobacco. Listen to this. I couldn't talk right, but every word that came out of my mouth was cuss words. Every single word that came out of my mouth was cuss words. I was so undependable and so unreliable in the military, they didn't know what to do with me. My job eventually began, ended up being, and I, I went through electronic school. I, I, it was just me and one other guy on the very bottom. When I got through electric school, I was supposed to be an automatic E4 
four, but they kept me as an, I mean, E3, but I, I was in the lowest grade for whatever it was. I can't remember what it was in the Navy, but I was the lowest grade. I never got elevated to a higher grade because I was such a mess up. So when I ended up at this military base on Adak, Alaska, the only thing they could give me to do, and I was not good at it, was shoveling horse manure out of the stalls for the horses they used the guys to go out hunting caribou with. So I'm out there. I am a mess. And one day I was walking down a sidewalk and I was spitting black stuff like a grasshopper if you squeeze it too much. And I spit it on the sidewalk in a great, and as I did it, I was walking by a lieutenant. He got mad at me. He made me get down on my hands and knees and wipe up that spit, that, that tobacco juice. And I said to myself, they'll never do it to me again. So I would spit the tobacco juice in my pocket. And I just want to tell you where I come from. I would spit the tobacco juice in my pocket to where it would overflow. In my pocket. I thought I was cool, man. See, I was so neat. And then, you know, I felt I was kind of a hippie. And so I went to the mess hall and I got a bunch of chicken necks. The chicken necks. And I boiled them in, I don't know why, I boiled them in water and vinegar and to where all the flesh came off and then I took a leather strap and I put the leather strap through the neck bones of the chicken tied it made a necklace so now I got a chicken bone necklace on I'm spitting my tobacco I'm smoking three and a half packs of cigarettes a day I'm popping my pills smoking my dope and drinking my wine so you could smell me coming because my chicken bone stunk so bad I mean, I smell like pure vinegar, and the tobacco juice would be running down my face. Well, then I wanted to be a cowboy, but they had no, they had no cowboy shop on, on, on Adak, Alaska. But there was one of the guys I knew that had an old cowboy hat. He had like an old stension or something. But the hat was way too big for me. And so I took a ski cap, I put it on the inside, and I sold it all the way around. And I stuck that big old cowboy hat on. So I had this big boy, I had this humongous cowboy hat on. I had my necklace of chicken bones. I had the chewing tobacco coming out of my pocket, and I stuck like vinegar. But now when I was a young boy, my older brother one day knocked my front tooth out of my head. I was trying to hide from him in our basement. That's where I slept with my brother. And I was under the bed, and I stuck my head up to see where he's at. And he jumped on the bed at that moment, slammed my head into the floor of the concrete, broke my tooth off, and so I got a cap to, uh, tooth. But when I was in the Navy, got in a fight, and I got my tooth knocked out. So now I got this cowboy hat on that's way too big for me. I got the necklace of chicken bones. I got the chewing tobacco in my pocket. I've got it running out. I'm smoking my cigars. I'm smoking my dope. I'm drinking, and I ain't got no tooth in my face. And my nickname was Tooth. Everybody could, hey, Tooth, how's it going? Now, wait a minute. I was a total, absolute, complete mess. You don't know what a mess is until you would have met me. I was an accident, and everywhere I went, I was a happening. And so on my 19th birthday, with such manic depressant, you cannot believe it, because I could not hear, I could not talk right. I was a complete mess, and I went into that little bathroom, and I took a big survival knife, which I did cut myself with a couple days later, and I went to slice my wrist, because I had no value, I had no worth. I was a complete, utter, absolute failure. I did not know a person I knew that I could look at and make myself feel good about myself you know what I mean in the natural sense you can look at it somebody and say man I'm so glad I'm not them now don't look around I'm so glad I'm not them I didn't know a person I could do that to I'd look in the mirror and I was just so filled with self-hate and self-loathing and just self-shame and I went to slice my wrist and as I went to slice my wrist a wonderful thing happened the fear of God fell on me like a blanket and I knew I was going to hell I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Nobody ever preached hell to me. No one ever told me about Jesus as far as I can remember. But I knew I was going to hell. I knew it. I knew I deserved it. And I dropped that knife into the sink. I turned around, walked out the door of that little bathroom. We call it a head in the Navy. I fell to my knees, and I cried out to Jesus Christ. The minute I cried out to Jesus, 
he came rushing into my heart. I mean, rushing into my heart. It was so drastic for me. Because you understand, I mean, I was, I was not at the bottom of the barrel. I was under the barrel. It was so drastic to me. Right then and there, I fell so in love with Jesus. I didn't know any other Christians. I didn't know any of the guys in my battalion that knew Christ. They never preached Jesus to me. After I got born again, I found out that quite a number of them were confessing Christ, but I never saw Christ. But when that happened to me, right away I went to my drawer, and they had given me a little green Gideon Bible when I joined the Navy, and I had it all those years, never opened it, and I opened it up, and I began to read about this man named Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I tell you, it was so radical. The transformation happened so powerful. I took my cigarettes right then and there. And I threw them all away. I took my drugs. I flashed them down the toilet. I took my rip of wine. I got rid of it by Southern Comfort, my tequila. I dumped it out. I grabbed all my magazines of filth and pornography, and I threw them away. I took my records of the Grateful Dead and Dr. Hook and the Medicine Band and Pink Floyd, and I broke them over my knees, and I threw them away right then and there. And I grabbed my little Bible, and I just began to devour Jesus. And I began to share right away. See, I didn't realize that my mind was being transformed because the Bible says, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. And then I began to discover about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I kept coming across where it talked about the Holy Ghost. I never heard anybody speak in tongues. I really didn't know any Pentecostal people. But one night, within two weeks after I was saved, I said, Lord, I just want, and I'm trying to share Jesus with people. I'm telling you, do you know Jesus? Let me tell you Jesus. I'm saying Jesus is for me. Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. Can I tell you Jesus? And they used to always laugh at me. But here I'm reading my Bible, and I said, Lord, I need the Holy Ghost in my mind. My, my lack of ability to speak, I'm crying, like, oh God, oh God, I need the Holy Ghost. I'm going to be a witness for you, Jesus. Jesus, fill me with the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, it was like oil being poured into me. And up out of my belly came this new language, and my tongue was loose because I could never twirl my tongue. I could never twirl it. And now my tongue was loosed. And I opened up my mouth, and my speech impediment was gone. Whoa, did I start to preach. <laughs> but see, I did something which a lot of Christians don't do. I didn't realize that what you put inside is what will possess you. That even as David, when he, before he committed sin, he was this. You, you know what David was, was thinking about because of the songs he wrote. The songs he wrote reveal his mind, his heart was always on his maker, his creator, on the one who, who made all existing things. And so, and, and we're not talking about a man who was born again. We're not talking a man who had the Holy Ghost except for the, spirit, the fact the Spirit of God came on him when Samuel anointed him to be king. But here a man is, a young man, he is so caught up in Jesus. He doesn't know his name is Jesus, but he knows he's the Christ, the Messiah. He's coming, and one day he's out there, and I think he's just singing songs to God, just out there strumming on his harp and he's singing a song. He's writing a new song every day. And one day he heard all of a sudden the roar of a lion and he heard the, the crying of one of the little lambs. And I believe he just, something happened inside of him. Something snapped inside of him. And it wasn't him, it was God rose up in him. And David saw the lion running away with the lamb in his mouth and he ran him down, jumped on his back, grabbed him by the beard and broke his neck. Said, you ain't, eat, you ain't taking one of my little lambs. How did David do that? It wasn't David. It was God in David. See, because your eyes, your eyes are the gateway to your heart, your mind. We know that one day there was a, a bear, and he ran out and he killed the bear. How? He was so full of Christ. He was so full of God because that's what he was singing. That's what he was singing. You know, that's why the Bible says, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead. He's talking to the church. And Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And be not drunk with wine, wherein this excess, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to yourself, not preaching to others, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. 
See, as you begin, you don't know this. You are an oven, whatever you put in you. You know, we look at people that are moving in God, they're moving in His Spirit, they're moving in the realm of the supernatural, and we go, ooh, ah, wow, aren't they something? Well, no, you don't understand. You're no different than they are. Now, they might be called to be what we call an apostle, prophet, man, pastor, and teacher, but he said, them that believe, these signs shall follow them. All they did is they stuck the right thing into their oven. They took the word and they stuck it in their oven. You know, you can turn that oven to where it goes real high or real low. You can cook food real, real. You can cook food so slow that to where you don't even know it's cooking. So it's just what they put in their oven. You know why people are tormented? Because they got the wrong things in their oven. They're cooking the wrong stuff. You know what? You cook the wrong stuff in the oven, and it will bring a stink out. You ever, have you ever stunk? I'm not talking about physically. Your attitude, your words. You know, that's why the Bible says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You know, the Bible tells you don't ever complain. You know, the Bible tells you not to complain. The Bible tells you not to murmur. The Bible tells you not to gripe. I just can't help griping. I just can't help complaining. You know why? Because that's the bird you got cooking in your oven. You got the griping bird in your oven. You're cooking the wrong bird. You got to put the right stuff inside of you. I mean, that's really how simple it is. If you look there in John chapter 15, look in John chapter 15, listen to what Jesus said in verse 6. This is not written to just his disciples. Uh, well, it's written to those who are following him. See, you got to follow Jesus. You know, it's funny how we think God is our servant. Yo, God, give me a new car, God. You ought to thank the Lord. He don't just slap you down and squash you. No, you know what? You ought to say, Lord, not my will. You know, God will let you have what you want. You want a king? God will give you. I'm talking about the Jews. They wanted a king. He said, man, you guys don't want a king. He's going to take the best of everything you got. He's going to take your daughters, your sons. He's going to take your best cattle, your best horses. You don't want a king. Oh, yes, we want a king. Well, God will give you the desires of your heart. Hello? You know, <laughs> God gives us what we want. Sometimes we end up with what we want, and we say, oh, God. I know people, that, oh, God, give me a husband. Give me a husband. You get a husband, you go, oh, God, set me free from this guy. <laughs> or a wife. Or a car. Or a job. Or something else. You know what? You ought to be crying, God, I want you. I want you, Jesus. All I want is you, Jesus. And everything else, I know you'll bless me with it, but I don't really care. That's why Paul said, I've learned to be content. I know how to be full, and I know how to be hungry. I know how to abound, and I know, I know how to live in a state of lack. It's okay with me, because as long as I've got Jesus, and Jesus has got me. See, you begin to become obsessed and possessed and consumed. Listen, you will become possessed by whatever you set your eyes on and you look at it long enough, you'll want it. Really, this happened to me years ago. I, I used to have a Cadillac Seville. I think it was like a, I don't know, it was like a 73 or 75 or something. And then they came out with those humpback Cadillacs. Remember them humpback Cadillacs, ugly things? They had a set in the back. And I told my wife one day, I was driving down the road, and I seen one of them humpback Cadillacs, and I said to her, I said, Honey, look, they, they wrecked that Cadillac. Look at the hump they put on that back. I said, Ain't that the ugliest thing you ever did see? And every time I'd go buy a Cadillac like that, I'd look at it and shake my head. And one day I was going by, and I stopped shaking my head. Another day I went by, I started liking it. One day... My wife was shopping, and so, you know, I don't like to walk around and shop. I, I just, you know, I just have ants in my pants. You know, I'm just, I don't like shopping. You can ask her. It takes faith for me to walk around with her, you know, and push the cart, you know, because I, I go into these grocery stores and these shopping places, and I don't want to see myself like an old man pushing the cart around while the wife is dumping stuff in it. You know, I just, to me, that's almost like a nightmare. So I don't want to do that. But anyway, so one day my wife was shopping. And I go past a Cadillac dealer, and they had one of them Seville's in there, and I pulled in, and I'm walking around that Cadillac, and now I want one. <laughs> See, when I first looked at it, I didn't want it. I thought, man, that ugly thing, who would ever drive that? Next thing you know, I'm wanting to drive one. Next thing, I'm beginning to plot and plan how to get one. Next one, I determined I am going to get one of those Cadillac Seville's, which I had just despised about a month before. And one day I was conniving about how to get a Seville, and the Lord spoke to my heart. 
He said, son, he said, number one, you don't need that Seville. He said, number two, you just proved a point that whatever you put in front of you, you'll end up wanting. See, that's why we need to put the word of God in front of us every day. See, David, he is a man of faith, and one day he's not out fighting no more because the people are afraid of him getting killed, so he's not going to battle anymore when the kings make battle, and they got him at home. He goes up. He's already got five wives. Come on. Come on. How many wives does a man need before he's satisfied? Come on, one. <laughs> See, I've said that before I ever got married. I said, I will be happy with one wife. And my wife says, I am happy with one husband. Yeah, how many white women want more than one husband? You'd be nuts, wouldn't you? <laughs> so, he, you know, but one day he's up there and he's looking around and there he sees his one of his mighty men, Uriah, his wife at late at night is out there taking a shower, taking a bath, instead of turning his face away like David, J Jesus, when he rode on the sand when they caught the woman in adultery, he takes a peek. And that peek ends up to being a stare. And that stare ends up possessing his heart. Next thing you know, he's conniving to get that woman. And then he gets the woman, and she gets pregnant. Look at, we're talking about a man who has a heart after God, who has now been possessed with lust, who is now a conniver, an adulterer, and he ends up becoming a murderer. How did that happen, David? The Bible says, if any man thinks he stand, let him take heed lest he fall. What you put, you know what? I'm amazed that Americans aren't more messed up. They go home and they turn on that TV and they are, I don't know what the statistics are, but the number of killings and murders and rapings and cuss words and filth that pours out of that box every day. How can people even have any sanity? I don't understand. I don't put that filth in my mind. I don't put that garbage in me. Because you know why? Because they're eggs. And you will, you will hatch those eggs. You cannot put that stuff inside of you and be like Jesus Christ. But I want to be like Jesus. It's so simple. So he tells us there in verse 7. Verse 7. Look what it says in verse 7. That's where we've been trying to get to. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. That means to dwell, to live, to remain. If you live in me, and my word lives in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, how many know we run into people who exaggerate? I mean, you know, they, ma they make a mole into a mountain, just exaggerate. How many know God does not exaggerate? God doesn't exaggerate. He meant exactly what he said, and he said exactly what he meant. And when he said, if you, you, that's, that, God's not respect your people. Point at your neighbor and say, you, you. He said, if you abide in me, if you abide in me, and my word, my what? My word abides in you. Now remember, why did he leave the children of Israel out in the wilderness for 40 years? For one reason. He said that you might learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Years ago, the Lord told me, he said, many of my people will never come out of the wilderness until they die. I said, why, Lord? Because they haven't learned that man does not live by natural things, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. See, koala bears, they need what, what, what do they call that, that kind of leaf? Yeah, that's right. I can't even say it. That's the kind of leaf. They can only live on that kind of leaf. You know what? You and I were made to live from this word. Now, not just the letter of the word, but the quickened word. It's like a cow. I like milk. You know, actually, I like milk right from the farm. When I was a young boy growing up, we never had this pasteurized stuff. We got it right from the farm with all the cream and everything on top. Man, I just loved it, you know. And now it's illegal to buy it, I guess, in some areas. But that's how we used to drink it. But you know what? That cow goes out there, and everything's a type in the shadow. And he takes a big mouthful of that green grass, and he chews it and chews it and chews it, and she swallows it. And it goes down into one of her bellies. And after a while, she regurgitates it. Brings it back up. 
choose it all over again. Choose it and choose. You can see him chewing the cud all the time. Out there chewing the cud. Chewing and chewing and chewing it. And then they swallow it. I don't know how God did it, but it gets back. It gets into the right belly and they regurgitate it again. And they chew it and they chew it and they chew it. And at the end of the day, the farmer sits down early in the morning with a bucket, with a pail. And he begins to milk that cow and brings it in. And they have a glass of nice, creamy, white milk. Praise the Lord. How many know you would not want to interfere with the process and drink that stuff the second time around? It's got to go three times. It's got to go three times. You know, people memorizing scripture, it really doesn't help you a lot just memorizing scripture really doesn't help you a lot because it's here and not here it's got to become faith how do you know when you've chewed the word enough when all of a sudden joy begins to bubble up inside of you see because joy is the expression of faith where there's joy, there is faith. I don't think when David ran after Goliath, he was saying, oh, God, help me. Oh, God, help me kill this giant. Oh, God, help me take him down. I said I was going to cut off his head. No, he was so full of faith and so full of joy, he ran. He ran at the Goliath. He ran, swung that stone in the name of the Lord, loosed that rock. God took that rock. Hit, it, hit that giant in the head, sunk it, and the man fell down. He ran up, grabbed that great big old sword of glass, and just chopped off his head like a, like a hunk of cabbage, cutting it in half, and picked it up, that bloody mess. And he, he, he marched back into the camp. Matter of fact, actually the Bible says the Philistines ran. I believe he ran after the Philistines as they were running from him. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. See, I'm telling you, you got to get the word if you abide in me and my word abides in you. You shall ask what you will and it shall be done. See, you got an oven. Put your, put your hand on your belly. You got an oven. That, that's the part of you that digests the food. You eat it. You chew it. You swallow it. Now, some of you don't chew it enough, <laughs> but you chew it. You're supposed to chew it so many times. You swallow it. It gets into your belly. That digestive juices begin to process it. It begins to flow through your body, and it begins to bring increase. Amen. <laughs> and it's digesting that food, and you couldn't live without it, spiritually speaking. How in the world do people survive in the house of God, the body of Christ, without meditating on his word? See, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. See, you're not talking about someone who, who had his stuff together all the time. I, I, I was... I was the least likeliest candidate to ever do anything for God. I mean, my mind was completely scrambled. I mean, you know, it was completely nothing but spaghetti noodles. I mean, it was all twisted and messed up. And I mean, you couldn't even understand what I said. I didn't understand what you said because my hearing was wrong. And I mean, I was just, I was just, you know, and, 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 you know, when I went to slice my wrist, it was because my older brother, Dennis, he was an acid freak. And I came home one day, and he, he had taken over a dose of drugs and tried to kill himself. And I remember calling the operator, and they came and pumped his stomach out. And about a year later, I came home, and here's my sister, Debbie, and she had taken an overdose. And the same thing happened again. And here's my dad. He's an alcoholic, a gambler, very smart, but filled with nothing but bitterness and hate. Filled my heart with hate towards my grandparents and towards my mother. He was a woman abuser. He beat my mom, break her jaw, bust her ribs. I mean, I was a total, complete mess. If you would have met me on the road, you would have wrote me off and said, there's no hope for him. There is no hope for him. I guarantee I have not personally yet met a person who was as messed up as I was at that time in my life. But you know what happened? When Christ came into my heart, this is what I did. I gave him my heart. I gave him my heart. When I gave Jesus my heart, I gave him my mind. See, I had no other reason to live. I had no, I had no goals. I had no plans. I had no motives. I had no, didn't have any grand, dear ideals of being somebody. 
Come on, man. Little kid, if you would have gone to our hometown in McGuanago, Wisconsin, in our school, the kids would walk around imitating my speech and make fun of me. That's why I quit school at 15 years old. That's why I did the drugs and the alcohol. I was trying to find acceptance. So when I gave my heart to Jesus, as far as I was concerned, nobody loved me. Nobody cared about me. Nobody had time for me. The only one who did was Jesus. You know what I did? I gave myself to Jesus. I just gave myself to the Bible. I gave myself to prayer. I gave myself. I wasn't trying to get something from God. I just gave myself to him. I just said, oh, Jesus, Jesus, Je I mean, morning, noon, and night, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And before I got out of the Navy in three months, in three months I was literally in charge over battalions of men. And I was running battalions, and they were giving me jobs to do, and I was in charge. Give the Lord a hand clap. How can that be? I didn't lay down on a couch and speak to any psychiatrist. They didn't give me any kind of drugs to help me, you know, with my, you know, mental, emotional problems. No, Jesus came, but I gave myself to Jesus. See, I didn't know what I was doing. I took the word of God and I shoved it into the oven of my soul. And I began to bake and cook the word inside of me. And that's all I did, just cook the word and cook the word and cook the word. Next thing you know, man, I'm operating in the gifts of the spirit. I'm casting out devils. I'm walking into places and I'm looking at people and I see what's wrong with them physically, not knowing it was a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom, not knowing I had the gift of discerning of spirits, not knowing what the gift of faith was, not knowing. And it's in that one book out there, Living in a Realm of the Miraculous. Them are not make-believe stories. Them are true. But all that happened was not because I'm some kind of spiritual giant, because I was called to be an apostle, because I was anything. It's just... I stopped putting anything else inside of me that wasn't of God. Nobody told me, don't watch TV, don't watch movies, don't read fiction books, don't read magazines. Don't. I, just, I just didn't. I just began to eat Jesus and drink Jesus. You know, that's how Jesus said, you'll have life. He said, if you'll eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will have life. He said, you'll have a life. What? A life of victory. A life. Of, when we came here back in 1983, this was nothing but a cow field with cow pies everywhere. <laughs> it's just nothing with no money, with just nothing, just 70 people in a little old garage. But I was obsessed with Jesus. When Jesus said jump, I said, yes, sir. When he said run, I said, yes, sir. When he said do this, I said, yes, sir. See, you are going to be the slave of something. Something is going to control you. Now, Pastor Mike, how do I know I can be controlled by the right thing? First of all, I realized, first of all, see, I knew something that a lot of people don't know. I knew that I was a complete, utter mess without Jesus Christ. See, the problem is some people, they, they're kind of, well, you know, I'm not a total mess, so I can hold on to this part of my life. I can keep this opinion. I can keep this ideal. When I went to the Bible, see, I was raised in Catholicism, but I wasn't, a, I wasn't a good learner. I couldn't hear what they said anyways. But here's what I did. When I went to the Bible, I simply went to the Bible as if a child going into preschool. This is what I did. I went to my Bible, and I said, whatever this book says in the New Testament, I'm going to do what it says. That's what I did. So, oh, look at they lifted hands, holy, lift holy hands, lift holy. So I just right away by myself in my little barracks would lift holy hands. I would just do it. I didn't know the scripture says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. See, if you think you know God and you don't do the word of God, you're deceiving yourself. Well, don't beat up on yourself over it. Just say, Lord, forgive me for deceiving myself. Because I should just do what you tell me to do now I didn't do God's will because I felt holy goosebumps because I had chills up and down my spine though I did have a lot of manifestations of the spirit many visitations of God well how I still get visitations of God all the time God visits me but you know what it is I'm not trying to get a visitation I'm simply making sure what I put into the oven. Now, let me also tell you this. So on the negative side, there's been times I put stuff inside of me since I've been saved. I should have never put in me. And some of those things almost destroyed me 
until God said, you better deal with that or that would destroy you. For instance, bitterness. Bitterness. How can out of the same fountains flow sweet water and bitter? So I know the sweet water is coming from heaven. The bitter water is coming from what? The old man that needs to be crucified. So I have had to learn to not let any bitterness come into my heart. I refuse to be bitter. I refuse to be unforgiving. I refuse to be judgmental. I refuse to be controlling or manipulating. See, I know men who are pastors, and they try to manipulate their congregations, and some do it out of love, but I will not manipulate you. I will not try to control you. I will not be critical of you. Listen, when people come into this place, the Lord told me years ago, he said, son, treat it like it's a hospital. When sick people come through that door, you're not trying to find fault with them. You're trying to help them get healed and get healthy and get better. There's a lot of people operating in a wrong kind of spirit, and they don't even know it. They're like those men who wanted to stone that woman caught in adultery, where Jesus said, where's thine accusers? He said, neither do I accuse you. Rise and sin no more. We'll give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Come on, praise the Lord. Here, here's the good news. First of all, I do not really believe I have even scratched the surface of what God wants to do in Mike Yeager. I really don't. See, those Old Testament anointings where you saw Elijah out running the horses and the chariots, those Old Testament miracles where you saw the meal being multiplied and feeding the, feeding the widow lady and her son and Elijah through the, the, those Old Testament miracles where you saw the axe head floating. Let me tell you, all those things in the old plus more are still available today. I have experienced so many different levels of the spirit that if I would tell you, you would think I was a liar. My son Daniel saw this some years ago. I got it in my heart to begin to confess scriptures to where the fire would not kindle upon me. I mean, I got this thing in my heart that the flames... That fire could not consume me because I would build a wood stove and I would get it so hot I would get my hand against it I would burn my hand and so instead of saying God give me wisdom not to touch the wood stove I found scriptures about not the fire hurting me and sure enough I would touch the hot stove but I found out pretty soon my hand wouldn't blister it just turned red and I didn't put my hand against it on purpose and one day I was cooking I was getting ready to cook eggs in my kitchen and a man came by to see me, and I had regular uh, vegetable oil in the, in, the, in, the, in the black skillet pan, and my wife was in the kitchen. I got to talking to Paul Waite, had the stove turned up. I don't know why when I cook stuff, I like to cook it on high. I always cook it on high. I don't cook, put it on medium or low. I put it on high. I don't know why, but I put it on high. The next thing, my wife is screaming. She said, honey, honey. I turn around, and here that vegetable grease had exploded in the fire, turned to fire. Now, how many know you got to get it pretty hot for vegetable grease to become fire? I wasn't even thinking. I yelled to Paul, wait. I said, Paul, open the door. And I ran because the house was just an old wood structure that could have just gone up. I mean, the, the, the shelves and the cabinets were all just old like wood. So I ran over there without thinking. I scooped that black frying pan up into my bare hands. My wife saw it. Paul saw it. I ran outside. I flipped it upside down to put out the flames, and then I realized what I did, and my hands turned a real light pink. I never got one blister. So here, two years ago, we got a big old wood pile out here. My mind is, I'm thinking on the word, I'm thinking on the word. Now, that's no excuse, but I had a big wood pile out here. I decided to burn it one day. It was so hot, I had a, a red container full of gasoline. It was so hot, the fumes were coming out of the gas container, coming out. It was probably 90 degrees that day. I went over there and I grabbed up that can of, of gasoline that, in that plastic jug. You know, how many know that fumes are very, very ignitable very quick? So I take it over to this big wood pile. I'm not even thinking. I'm taking it and I'm splashing it all around me. I'm thinking about Jesus, really. Just thinking about God. I'm splashing it. You know, I'm just kind of out there somewhere, you know, and I'm splashing it. I get done. I, got the, I put the can in my hand, my, right, my left hand, and I took my lighter, one of them long stem lighters. I reached down, and Danny, my son, saw me, and he yells, Dad, don't! And I pulled the trigger, and I was engulfed in fire. No, I am literally engulfed in fire. I am in the flames. I've got the can of gasoline in my hand. I, 
fire. I am not exaggerating. My son Dan will tell you he could not see me. I am surrounded by flames. I'm telling you, I'm in the fire, and there's like this invisible force field around me. And I'm looking, and I'm going, wow. Whoa. And I stepped out of the flames. Not singed or burned. Give the Lord a hand clap. <laughs> How come, Pastor Mike, I'm going to tell you the reason why. It's not because I'm so spiritual. It's not because I'm so dynamic. It's not because I'm anything. You know why? Because I am really dumb. That's why we're writing a book called I Need God Because I'm Stupid. It's going to be full of stories like that. Dumb things I have done. My kids have seen me do some really stupid stuff. <laughs> but you know what it was? It was the word in my heart. See, you have an oven. Right now, every one of you has something cooking in that oven. If you got the wrong stuff cooking, because whatever you're cooking in your oven, you're going to have to eat it. Yeah, you're going to have to. Do you know that? You eat, yeah, you're going to give it to other people. Yeah, whatever you cook in your oven, you're always shoving it in people's face. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, you are offering what you're cooking to others. And when people go, oh, no, uh-uh, I don't want that. And some people, you force feed them that stuff you bet got cooking in your oven. But listen, let me tell you right now. You got wrong stuff cooking in the oven of your heart, you better pull it out. And you better throw it away. See? Then people are always offering to put stuff in your oven. No, thank you. No, I don't, no, no. I don't want, I don't, if you're offering me something that's not the word of God, I'm not putting it in my oven. You know, the Bible says, take heed lest the spirit of bitterness rise up in you and many be defiled. You've got to watch it. There's people walking around, and their oven is so full of bitterness, they're serving it to everybody. Here, have some bitterness. Have some resentment. Ha have some. Uh, the Bible says, speak evil of no man. And they're serving this stuff. And people are taking it and shoving it into their ovens. And you're cooking bitterness or resentment or hate or fear or bitterness or anger or whatever it is. I just want the Lamb of God cooking in my oven. Close your eyes and lift your hands towards heaven, won't you? Michael, will you put some worship music on? Lord, all we want is the Lamb of God cooking in our ovens. Lord, all we want is you. Father, I know tonight you told me you were going to do radical transformation. Lord, tonight. Radical transformation. Yeah, Michael, put some music on, please. Radical transformation. Say, Lord, I want to be radically transformed. Radically changed. I want to look just like you. I want to talk just like you. <laughs> I'm going to live just like you. I want to walk just like you. I want to be just like you. Thank you, Father. I know it's your will. I know I can apprehend it. I know by grace I can do it. And from this moment forward, my life will never be the same. Now, tonight I know some of you have been experiencing some torment. We all get tormented at times. But God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind not God's will for you to be tormented we can take authority see because these thoughts you have there's spiritual powers behind it we want to see you set free from torment tonight so if you're dealing with any kind of torment I want you to come up here right now and let's get you free from that torment right now just come right up to the green line of life now as God sets you free from torment this is what you're going to have to do you're going to have to pull whatever you got cooking in your mind out in your heart you got to pull it out how do you pull? Shove it out with the word of God. Shove it out with the word of God. Amen? Just, Nancy, I tell you what. Janet, I always call you Nancy. Janet, come up here. I tell you what. God says, listen, you, you don't have to be tormented. I love you. No, the Lord says, I love you. I love you. And I gave myself for you. And you're my daughter. And you don't have to be tormented. You don't have to be tormented whether or not I will reject you or if I love you or if I will embrace you. I have embraced you. The Lord says, you are mine. I, 
man, you know what? I see Jesus in you, Janet. I see Jesus. How many of you see Jesus in Janet? Look, look now. Look, these people know you. They see Jesus in you. Even Larry's got his hands up. See that? We see Jesus in you. Amen. So I want you to come up here, and I want some of you sisters that see Jesus and Janet, come up here and pray over her right now. Because I'll tell you what, I'm looking back there, and I see that spirit of torment trying to just come upon you. And it's a stinking lie of the devil. Amen. So sisters, begin to pray over her right now. Now, praise the Lord. There's nobody else here tonight tormented. Nobody's got a spirit of fear on them. Nobody's tormented. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 You're not tormented. You're happy in Jesus. Yeah, I know you're tormented. Get up here. <laughs> Amen. I'm so glad your daughter jumped up before you did, too. <laughs> See, that spirit's got to go over you guys, man. That spirit of torment has got to go. It's got to go. Amen. It's got to go. So Pastor Richard, come up here and minister with me. And, 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 and Johnny and Juanita, come up here and pray for these people. Come on. There are speakers for tomorrow. Praise the Lord. They're going to take team it. And Pastor, start praying. You can start to start praying. Hey, I'll go with your family. Amen. They're my family too. Now, if you need physical healing in your body, I wanna, I want, I want you to come up and let God heal your body. Sister Esther, you can come up and start praying for the people. But if you need healing, Natasha, I want you to come up here. God wants to touch you. God don't want you to be tormented, sister. <laughs> Amen. No more torment. No more torment. Amen. And sister, just start praying for these people right down here. Just start with this young lady, sister. Now, Lord, I thank you that my sister is no longer tormented. Hallelujah. <laughs> she repeats.